The Hindenburg leaves her hangar in the spring of 1936. She was the ultimate airship and the pride of Nazi Germany. A leviathan of the skies, she was 804 feet from stem to stern, longer than any of the world's battleships. With a gas capacity of just over 7 million cubic feet, Hindenburg was the largest aircraft that had ever flown. She had been built as an airborne liner, to ply the Atlantic route to the United States. Her 72 passengers flew in spacious luxury, housed inside the Hindenburg's massive Dürerlumine hull. They enjoyed elegant meals and relaxed in the saloon, where they were entertained by a special lightweight grand piano built of aluminium and weighing just 360 pounds. The huge slanting viewing windows were protected from the elements by the Hindenburg's hull and gave a panoramic view of the scene sliding by below. Airmail carried a special Hindenburg stamp. The Hindenburg's galley was all electric with no open flames. Her smoking saloon was sealed off from the rest of the airship. Only electric lighters were allowed on board. Fire was feared by all who designed and flew airships, lifted by millions of cubic feet of highly inflammable hydrogen. The smallest spark could spell disaster. But the Hindenburg seemed as safe as houses. In 1936, she represented the future of long distance air transport. Cruising at 80 miles per hour, she could cross the Atlantic in just two days, half the time of a blue ribboned liner. Her four diesel engines gave Hindenburg a range of 8,500 miles. Total confidence reigned on the flight deck. It was soon to be shattered. What should have been just another transatlantic crossing ended in the most spectacular disaster in aviation history. The greatest airship of them all was herself destroyed by fire in circumstances which have never been fully explained. Mystery still surrounds the last flight of the Hindenburg. The airship era lasted barely 50 years. Semi-rigid airships, like this Santos Dumont machine of the 1890s, paved their way. The father of the rigid airship was a German, Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin. His first rigid airship, LZ-1, took to the skies in July 1900. This is his fourth, LZ-4, which in July 1906 made a famous 12-hour flight from Germany to Switzerland. Overnight, Count von Zeppelin became a world celebrity. The airships he designed became known as Zeppelins. Three years later, the Count formed DILAG, the German Airship Transport Company, the world's first commercial airline. Between 1910 and 1914, DILAG carried nearly 40,000 paying customers to every corner of Germany. 
Zeppelin was now dreaming of airships which would circle the globe. For the moment, Delag's horizons were more modest. In conditions which would not have disgraced a first-class railway carriage, passengers enjoy a flight in Schwaben, Zeppelin's first successful commercial airship. In spite of their size, Zeppelin's airships were fragile and accident-prone. The men who flew them had to master modern technology and the ancient elements of wind and weather. Commanding a Zeppelin was likened to skippering a tea clipper in the great days of sail. Zeppelin's airmen were equal to the task. There were accidents in Dilag's first four years, but not a single life was lost. Germany led the world in airship design. In August 1914, German airships went to war. They cruised on reconnaissance flights over France, Russia, and the North Sea. In 1915, they launched a bombing campaign against Britain. They caused little damage, but the bombs they dropped opened a new era of aerial warfare. Many of the Zeppelins were brought down by bad weather or incendiary bullets fired by British night fighters. The Zeppelins were not war winners, but when peace came, their great range opened the way to long-distance transoceanic flights. The first transatlantic round trip, the key to a commercial future, was made by a British airship, R-34. One of her crew parachuted onto American soil to the delight of onlookers after a record-breaking flight which lasted just over 109 hours. As R-34 descended, discharging water ballast to slow her descent, the future of the airship seemed assured. But the high hopes held out for the airship were constantly dashed by disaster. In August 1921, the new British airship R-38, which was on trials for the US Navy, broke in half and plunged into the Humber estuary, killing 44 of her crew. Undeterred, the US Navy dispensed with British help and built its own airships. The most ambitious were the Macon and Akron. Both were lifted by helium, a gas which would not burn, but which was many times more expensive than hydrogen. The formidable reconnaissance range of these airships was increased by turning them into flying aircraft carriers. In their bellies, they carried four Curtis Sparrowhawk aircraft. The little biplanes were retrieved by a trapeze lowered from the airship, a difficult maneuver to master. The role of the ground crew was often equally dangerous. These three men were yanked into the air by Akron on the end of a landing line. Two fell to their deaths. The third survived by clinging to the line for over two hours. Macon and Akron both perished in accidents. After Macon went down off the Californian coast in February 1935, the American military airship program was canceled. The British had also pressed on with a new program of airship construction. During the 1920s, it was decided to hold a competition. Two airships would be built. One, the R-100, by a subsidiary of the Vickers Company. The other, R-101, by the government's own Royal Airship Works at Cardington. It was a classic contest between private enterprise and state funding, and it led to a major disaster. There were not enough top-flight British airship designers and engineers to support two projects. Most of the talent was concentrated at Vickers. Its team was led by the brilliant Barnes Wallace, who later designed the Dam Buster's famous bouncing bomb in the Second World War. In the summer of 1930, R-100 made a successful double crossing of the Atlantic. Things were not going so well at Carlington. The plan was to use R-101 to open up an imperial air route to India. She was to fly to the subcontinent and back in October 1930, arriving in London at the start of a conference at which the premiers of all Britain's dominions would be gathered. But the R101 had been plagued by teething troubles. 
It had been so serious that at the last minute she had been cut in half and 45 feet of extra gas bag added to her midriff. Her outer cover was rotting. R101 had not been flown on a single high speed or bad weather test. She was underpowered and overloaded with fuel. She was a disaster waiting to happen. The airship experts advised against flying. The politicians plowed on. R101 was loaded for departure. She was further weighed down by a huge red carpet, ready to be rolled out for a VIP dinner aboard her when she touched down in Egypt. A final conference was held at the Air Ministry on the 2nd of October. Lord Thompson of Cardington, the man who had dreamed up the idea of the airship competition, wanted to leave the next day. Eventually, takeoff was agreed for the evening of the 4th of October. The director of civil aviation, Air Vice Marshal Sir Sefton Branker, voiced his doubts. He knew of R101's inherent weaknesses. Thompson told him, if you are afraid, then do not go. Sefton Branker went. At 8 p.m. that night, the great airship flew over London. Rain and strong headwinds were forecast over France. In foul weather and weighed down by tons of water sloshing around in her cover, R101 crashed into a hillside near Beauvais in northern France. Lord Thompson was burnt to death in his bunk. There were only six survivors. After the funeral, the perfectly sound R100 was scrapped and along with it, Britain's airship program. Meanwhile, the Germans were back in the airship business. Hugo Eckner, Zeppelin's successor, led the way. After the First World War, Germany had been forbidden to operate any new airships. But an airship program began again in 1926. Its first result was the Graf Zeppelin. She made her maiden flight in September 1926. It was a prelude to nine uninterrupted years of service in which Graf Zeppelin flew over a million miles. In 1929, Graf Zeppelin made a record-breaking round-the-world flight. She cruised majestically over Siberia and then across the Pacific. It seemed that only the Germans had the know-how to make the airship dream a reality. In 1936, they unveiled the 129th Zeppelin, the Hindenburg. Most of the money to build her had been provided by Adolf Hitler's Nazi government. Hugo Eckner had wanted to lift her with helium, but the United States was the only producer of this non-inflammable gas. The US government refused to export helium if it was to be used for potentially military purposes. The Hindenburg would have to be lifted with highly inflammable hydrogen. Eckner was not unduly worried. He considered that there was a greater fire risk from the petroleum in the engines than a leak from one of Hindenburg's huge gas cells. Having paid for Hindenburg, the Nazis exacted their pound of flesh. In 1936, there was a referendum in Germany over Hitler's occupation of the Rhineland. Graf Zeppelin and Hindenburg were commandeered by Josef Goebbels' propaganda ministry. The Zeppelins crisscrossed the country, showering the population with leaflets and bombarding them with broadcasts. Hugo Eckner, who had nothing but contempt for the Nazis, made no secret of his opposition to the use of the airships as propaganda tools for Hitler. At a voting booth aboard the spanking new Hindenburg, 104 votes were cast for the German leader, none against. But there were those in Germany who were opposed to Hitler's policies of brutal racism and growing militarism. Their groups were small, scattered and uncoordinated. They watched with growing concern as Hitler tightened his grip. If banned books could be burned by the Nazis, then why not the hydrogen-filled Hindenburg? Hindenburg's first season was a resounding success. 
A sister airship was under construction and looked set to be completed by September 1937. Even bigger airships were in the pipeline. There seemed to be only one threat on the horizon. A rival transatlantic service provided by American flying boats to the west coast of Ireland. But these aircraft could not offer the luxury travel which was the hallmark of the Hindenburg. Hindenburg sailed serenely on. In Washington, the Germans hit back by laying on special VIP flights for politicians, industrialists and bankers. Special airmail was delivered, and passengers expressed their satisfaction at the flight. I enjoyed the trip tremendously. It was a real revelation. We've had a lovely time ever since we left Frankfurt. I only wish we could do it all over again. On the 3rd of May, 1937, Hindenburg emerged from her hangar in Frankfurt for her first transatlantic flight of the new season. Her destination was the airfield at Lakehurst, New Jersey. For some time, the Zeppelin company had been receiving letters from anti-Nazi groups threatening to sabotage the Hindenburg if she continued to fly to America. Some of the letters had been handed over to the American authorities by the German embassy in Washington. There is little evidence that the Zeppelin company took the threat seriously. After all, commercial Zeppelins had been flying since 1900 without losing a single passenger. The flight went ahead. This time, however, the passenger list was not full. Only 36 out of a possible 72. But the return flight was fully booked. The crossing to America was uneventful. Visibility was poor, and passengers spent much of their time relaxing in the bar, dozing, or discussing the political situation in Germany. The Hindenburg glided over ice flows and then icebergs. At least one passenger was reminded of the fate which had befallen the Titanic. Landfall was made over Long Island Sound. Over New York, Hindenburg descended low enough for passengers to spot news photographers on their vantage point at the top of the Empire State Building. The landing at Lakehurst Airfield had been scheduled for four o'clock in the afternoon. But there was a delay. Dark rain clouds were massing over Lakehurst. Hindenburg skipper, Captain Pruss, decided to turn back towards the coast to wait for the anticipated thunderstorm to move away. At 6.30, tea and sandwiches were served on the Hindenburg while it cruised over the deserted beaches of the New Jersey coastline. Passengers idled away the time, gazing out of the windows at the forests of New Jersey below. The weather at Lakehurst cleared, and Captain Pruss commenced his landing approach. At 7.10, Hindenburg appeared over Lakehurst. Down below, passengers for the return flight filed into the departure lounge. Cameramen clung to the roof to record the landing, and newsmen prepared to file their copy. Hindenburg approached the mooring mast. Jettisoning ballast to slow her descent, she came down to 200 feet and prepared to drop her landing lines to the ground. It seemed like a routine landing. Passengers craned their necks for a view from the windows. Soon they would be setting foot in America. As the Hindenburg steel mooring cable emerged from her nose, a light rain began to fall. The landing lines went down. Then disaster struck. Radio reporter Herb Morrison had a ringside seat. The first and the plane. Get it started, get it started. It's, it's crashing. 
It's crashing terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames and, and it's falling on the morning bed. And all the folks agree that this is terrible. This is the worst of the worst catastrophes that the world still oh, is. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky. It is, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now. And the flame is crashing to the ground. Not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity and all the fans screaming around it. I don't do it. I can't really talk to people whose friends are out there. It's a... It's, it's a oh, I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Observers had reported a small jet of flame near the upper fin. Within seconds, Hindenburg was transformed into a giant torch. It had taken just 32 seconds from the appearance of the first flame to Hindenburg's final collapse into a mass of twisted metal and blazing wreckage. 36 people died in the inferno. 22 crewmen, 13 passengers, and one member of the ground crew. Astonishingly, 61 people jumped, crawled, or were pulled from the flames alive. One of the survivors was the acrobat, Joseph Spa. The only thing I can do is say that, I don't know, it all happened so fast. There isn't much to figure about. I do think that I'm very lucky that I'm sitting home here, in my own home again, after this experience this afternoon. And as I said before, I'm just happy. What had happened to the Hindenburg? One moment a monarch of the skies, the next a blackened outline in a New Jersey field. The US Department of Commerce launched an inquiry. The man in charge at Lakehurst, Commander Rosendahl, testified that he had seen a small mushroom-shaped flame forward of the rudder fin just before the explosion. After 18 days of testimony, the Department of Commerce invited Hugo Eckner, the grand old man of airships, to deliver his verdict. Eckner's verdict was highly speculative. He concluded that as the Hindenburg turned sharply towards the mooring mast, a bracing wire may have snapped in her stern, breaching a gas bag. The escaping gas was then ignited by static electricity when the landing ropes touched the ground in the highly charged atmosphere after the storm at Lakehurst. Tests to confirm this were inconclusive. Nevertheless, an investigation by the German government reached the same conclusion. This left many niggling doubts about the fate of the Hindenburg. How could the static electricity have traveled so quickly up the landing ropes? The small jet of flame seen by Rosendahl had not been captured on any of the newsreel footage of the disaster. The Hindenburg skipper, Captain Max Pruss, had a simpler theory. He believed that the Hindenburg had been sabotaged. At the inquiry, Pruss had been gagged by Josef Goebbels. The Nazi propaganda chief was determined to slam the lid down on any suggestion that someone could destroy one of the most visible international symbols of the Third Reich. It was not until the Third Reich itself was destroyed that Eckner's verdict was challenged. After the war, two crewmen came forward to claim that they had seen the flame which had sealed Hindenburg's fate. It was not at the top of the ship, as Rosendahl had testified and Eckner had assumed. It was inside, just where a gas bag was pierced by the main central gangway and less than 50 feet from the crewmen's landing stations near the lower fin. The men said that they had heard a sudden pop over their heads. They looked up to see a circle of bright light some three feet in diameter. They said it resembled a flashbulb igniting. Had a simple photographic timer set off the flashbulb, which was itself capable of igniting Hindenburg's hydrogen? And if so, who had planted the tiny device which had caused such devastation? Suspicion focused on a member of Hindenburg's crew, a rigger named Erik Speil. Speil was a keen amateur photographer and was also rumored to have anti-Nazi views. He was one of only three crewmen who normally used the axial gangway. He had the ability, opportunity, and perhaps the motive to plant a bomb. 
It is unlikely that Speil would have committed suicide by timing his flashbulb bomb to go off while the Hindenburg was still in the air. So the theory goes that it was time to explode after the Hindenburg had landed. But the delay caused by the storm at Lakehurst had disrupted Speil's plan, and he was unable to return from his landing station in the bow to reset it. Was the Hindenburg the victim of sabotage or an accident unique in the annals of rigid airships? We shall never know. The anti-Nazi rigor died in the disaster, and Hugo Eckner's explanation amounted to no more than a theory. The death of the Hindenburg remains an unfinished story.